So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our third webinar in our series uh, online conversations on global religious and secular dynamics. My name is Jose Casanova, and I'm a professor in the departments of sociology and theology and religious studies at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, which sponsors this series, along with Reset Doc USA. We are fortunate today, very, very fortunate indeed, I'm very happy to have with us the prominent Turkey's French, French sociologist, Nilifer Gele. Uh, who was for many years a professor at Bogacici University in Istanbul, and then for even many, many more years, a professor at EGES, uh, L'Ecole des Autetides in Sciences Cien Sociales uh, in Paris. So my dear friend, Nilifer, welcome. I'm very pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Jose. Uh, okay, so let's begin with your early work. Your first major book was The Forbidden Modern Civilization Unveiling. The original Turkish name of the title when it was published in Turkish was Modern Marem, which of course is related to the word Haram, which is the opposite of Halal and Harem. So it has a lot of very, very interesting connotations. Um, it was the first major study and the, what will become a crucial phenomenon veiling in the Muslim world, namely middle class educated Muslim women adapting the veil in the public sphere throughout uh, Muslim urban spaces and then also in the diaspora in Europe. And US was the first study. Why did you choose this title, The Forbidden Modern, and uh, what was your main Thesis. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Uh, this has been a long time. This was 30 years ago. And at that moment, religious secular divide was very profound in Turkey. Uh, and then in 30 years, it became even worse, I think. Now we can, we can uh, discuss this, um, but without losing our optimism and our scientific curiosity. It is true, I, before coming to the idea of the title, I started to work on this issue because it was the end of 1980s. Of course, the Iranian revolution, the Islamic revolution changed uh, very much deeply the uh, social scientific agenda. Political scientists took over the question of Islam, political Islam, and they were trying to define the economic and political conditions that led to the revolution and religion, it was the source for mobilization of masses for them. So I uh, attacked the subject of Islam. I approach through the question of women and the covering of women. I mean, uh, we can say it is a kind of soft belly <laughs> of the issue because Islamic revolution, it was a huge issue related with state, uh, change of regime and religion with big capital R. And I thought it was much, uh, I thought the issue, the, the question of women, especially the uh, covering of women, attracted my attention because it created a kind of uh, uh, unexplained, I couldn't explain it with the knowledge we have had on Islam, uh, neither on the narrative of modernity, because we were supposing that if the young people had access to education, they were going to leave behind their religious beliefs and uh, uh, traditional uh, practices. So there was a kind of anachronism with the fact that these girls who succeeded uh, high education, because it's quite difficult at the university campuses, they were becoming, uh, they were asking, they were claiming the headscarf at the university campus. So this was, um, of course, very troublesome for the secular background I have had also. 
So I was, I tried to understand first this pious subjectivities, who were these girls? And at the beginning, I must say, when I created the focus groups, I have already met with them, with these girls. Uh, at a given moment, I thought we were not speaking the same language. They were coming from some uh, faraway country speaking Arabic. And, uh, and we had such a thick wall between us culturally that I thought we didn't share the same language, same gender, same country. And at the end of the research, of course, I have found out that they were uh, alike, much more people with me, like me, the, the professors, than their mothers. So they had the aspiration to become professionals, to become professionals, intellectuals, anyhow. So they had this aspiration in public life. This was, of course, a contradiction in terms in, in when you think about religion with more traditional roles and they had this move uh, to the public life. So in that sense, I said the title should be uh, Modern Mahram. Mahram is this, this privacy in uh, the Islamic world, this habitus, which is more defined in gender terms and with sacrality. It is something that is forbidden normally. It's sacred. Uh, it's not only about individualism. Uh, so this Mahram, taken into the public, which is much a very modern move in a way, kind of coming out in the public life, I thought this kind of uh, uh, transformation of religion uh, is related with Muslim women's agencies, this tensions between private and public. The forbidden modern, because at that time, uh, publishing Mahram in my book as a title, it was impossible. The uh, editors didn't want the word mahram, although a footnote, they do not mind with jihad or <laughs> fatwa, but mahram, although it is much more interesting uh, concept to be um, used, not only to understand Islam, but also maybe our modern world. Uh, it, so I couldn't use it. So we found the word forbidden modern. So it is both modern and it is forbidden by itself, also by Muslims, but also by uh, secularists. So there's this tension uh, of this public and private. So I bet on the study of Islam through the categories of personal and public life. Now, as a sociologist, and this is something which obviously interests me, uh, you use the work of Irving Goffman on stigma precisely to show how a stigma can be turned into a badge of honor, a positive affirmation of identity rather than a negative stigma imposed upon those individuals. And it is this character, of course, which ta has taken secular people a very, 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 uh, uh, has been very hard for them to recognize that this is simply not an imposition from their parents, from society, but it's something that they uh, uh, basically embrace affirmatively as part of their identity. Uh, now, you move to France and the veiling controversy uh, uh, somehow came with you to France. Uh, when you came there and thereafter came the whole problem with the Foulard and the Burkas, the Stasi Commission, how was the situation, the debate, the controversy in France similar and different than the one you have analyzed in Turkey? Well, the difference is, of course, it is related with the migrant issue and uh, immigrants coming also the Algerian background in the case of France, the colonialism, the war background. But what was more important is the similarity with Turkey with the definition of secularism as uh, related with uh, uh, e equality, between gender equality. And in that respect, Turkey and like other uh, Muslim countries were in advance because from the very beginning of the modernization in the 20s and even before in the case of Turkey, modernization already in the Ottoman Empire, the question of women, the place of women in society, interior, exterior, whether she should have access to education or not, medical care, all these issues and also of course veiled or unveiled were main topics for modernization. So the Western modernity was taken, were discussed in these countries through these issues. So the question of women, the place of women, 
was from the beginning, as in the case of Egypt, in the case of Turkey, in the case of uh, Tunisia, it was central. So for us, for me, working on this topic, I have already approached the question of secularism, not only a state matter, question of state uh, uh, differentiation from religion, or a kind of textual institutional formation, but something that penetrated into the lives, everyday life, and uh, shaped the definitions of womanhood and the way they should behave in public, in private, for instance, social mixity as well, that is encountering men and women in restaurants, in sports, and uh, in education, mixed education. All these topics were from the very beginning central to the definition of uh, politics of secular modernity. So in France, when I raised this issue of secularism in relation to its part, the first reaction was secularism is much more important than a piece of cloth. So they didn't understand that the, this topic of uh, laïcité was so much uh, related with state politics that uh, it took some time to redefine itself in relation to a uh, re foreign, re foreign religion. And I think that's important because secularism uh, has been defined, as we have seen in the works of Marcel Gaucher, Charles Taylor, in relation to a particular also religion. Now what is happening in the European history is that that same secularism, laïcité, is taking shape in relation to Islamic presence. So the veiling issue was again at the center of that redefinition of French laïcité. So there was all the issues around uh, the French laïcité. So I think in, in, this, in the sense of longue durée, more uh, historical perspective, we can say how laïcité is reshaped by its encounter with a different religion than Christianity, that is Islam. So it became more didactic uh, in the sense that rather than inclusionary, we should teach Muslims how to uh, incorporate secular values, gender equality, and take those kinds of information to the schools. It should be, and there's a law, there are two laws indeed, that prohibits the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, veil and, and the burqa in general. Uh, what was interesting, uh, at the very beginning of these debates, uh, people were critical, critic, very critical of the French case especially coming from our colleagues in the United States, saying this is French exceptionalism, their laïcité is totally uh, a kind of French um, exceptionalism. Uh, however, we have observed in the last 10 years that French exceptionalism became a model of reference in many European countries now who wants to forbid burqa and who wants to control also the covering in the public schools and so on. With the end of multiculturalism as a reference, a rhetoric of reference, which was a very important moment, which started from the countries like Netherlands, much liberal and uh, multicultural, then it circulated from one country to another. And to, we have seen that the announcement of the end of multiculturalism meant especially the uh, uh, the hegemony uh, over Islam, the values of secularism and national values in each country. So that started like this and French became much more a model of reference than an exceptionalism. Um, as you mentioned, you yourself come from a secular background, even you could say a Kemalist background. And it was difficult for you at the beginning, but then you play a crucial role as a bridge, precisely this secular religious divide. Uh, you were able to move from one to another, as very few people did before in Turkey. And then you play a similar role within European public discourses, once precisely this divide between Islam and Western Christianity and Western secular modernity took place. And you then decided to dedicate yourself to the study of controversies around Islam in the European public sphere. You even came to argue, I think, uh, 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 forcefully and convincingly 
that actually Islam then played the role of uh, formation, the very constitutive formation of, the, of a European white public sphere through Islam. Not in its particular society, but a European public sphere was defined precisely in contradistinction to Islam. Um, can you tell us something about the research you did both individually, but also collectively throughout European societies following these controversies as a methodological tool to understand these dynamics, the way in which Islam and Western secular modernity were being constituted simultaneously and in contradiction to one another. Yes, thank you. I did. I, I, I have adopted a double gaze, you're right. I didn't uh, uh, double gaze both from European and from Islamic point of view. That's why the public sphere and public controversy seem to me the most appropriate tool to understand it because controversy is something that divides but also relates actors and creates new actors, assemblies, although there's a friction. So it's not the conflict but controversy that I adopted as a word because conflict is predetermined maybe as a social action whereas controversy takes place in the public sphere. It can be individuals, it can be a social group and then suddenly uh, there's a kind of transformation and configuration of that field through these controversies. The first thing is we had to, we needed to distance ourselves only from the media coverage of the controversy because we always think of controversy as a media coverage. But every, each time a public controversy stems in a given place and from a particular subject. So I had to um, go to the places where these controversies arise. And each time there were Muslims carrying, for instance, claiming their right to uh, have, their, uh, um, have, have their mosque, mosque construction in a given little town, or having a minare in Switzerland, although not a member of European Union, the, the debates around that uh, construction of a minare became very important, the referendum against the construction of minare or the cartoon controversy in Denmark. So each time there was a controversy related with Islam, I moved to that city and tried to find out how different actors, not only Muslims, because when it becomes a public matter, like Islam did, it is not only a Muslim-Muslim issue, it concerns the whole society, inhabitants of the city, and, and a country as well. If you want to construct a mosque, uh, right nearby a cathedral, like in the case of Cologne, then of course the inhabitants are also uh, related with that issue. If they want what kind, what kind of architecture of the mosque they want, what, who is going to preach, uh, the, what are the new imperatives, socially speaking, of a mosque in a European setting. It changes totally. It already has singularities in a European context. What I have observed is that how Islam is taking a new form through these controversies. And controversy means it is a debated issue. Like halal, for instance, I give another one because there was a constellation of uh, controversies, issues that were raised during my field study in 20 cities. We have made in 20 different cities the, 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 the study. Uh, and the halal, uh, which is, of course, is not an issue in a Muslim majority country, especially in terms of dietary uh, regulations. But in the case of the European context, for instance, more in France than in other countries, then halal food, because of ritual slaughtering, became an issue. So it was not treated as a uh, right for religious minority, which is the case of kosher for instance, that is, uh, Jewish communities have acquired uh, the right, after so many dramatic and tragic events, that halal, uh, uh, the kosher, and the ritual slaughtering, this was uh, regulated um, in terms of religious rights, minority rights, their right. Whereas the question of halal became a societal debate, public debate. Why is this ethically acceptable is this uh, provoking pain, suffering on animals or not. So it became a broader issue. 
uh, in that respect, it oriented more also the European public sphere and value. So for each, uh, I would say, controversy, I tried to understand how the European public sphere was getting uh, shaped and transformed. The, the controversies in question, each time it is related with the pious person. So I'm not interested, for instance, with a controversy which is only mediatic, but a controversy that is carried by subjects, Muslims, who want to create this, the shape, the architecture of their mosques. That's important because it's not an issue of praying rooms. Most of the people say we have enough praying rooms. So it's not only about praying rooms. It's a, more about a sense of belonging. If they have singularity, uh, expression of their singularity with a kind of architecture, then they, they, it becomes a marker also of the presence of Muslims in the long durée. Because when you speak about migrants, they are going to leave. Whereas when you speak of Muslims living in Europe, it's a way of getting uh, more and more settled. So in a paradoxical way, uh, Islamic presence, I mean, migrants presented their presence through Islam since the 1980s with the veiling, with the mosque and minare uh, controversies, halal, and uh, even a little controversy we've had on, in Germany on circumcision of young boys, which is interesting also because it brings in the Jewish uh, religion as well into the picture. And also uh, the, the images, the representation of sacred images of Islam. So the fact that they want to keep their relation to these sacred uh, figures of Islam, prophet and uh, the other. So I think, so it, it also, uh, just one more word, what I found out moving from the Islamic veiling working that I have done in Turkey, and then I moved to Europe, I've seen the importance of the, this personal and public life, public sphere, and how this public sphere was refashioned and transformed by its encounters in Europe uh, uh, with Islam. Although we can speak of exclusion of uh, Muslims uh, this way or not, when you look at that level, the social structure, there's a lot of creative, uh, I would say, uh, hybridity between religious and secular categories. You cannot say this is only Islamic or this is only secular. We see more and more the European figures of Islam is part of that cultural um, fabric. Uh, of course, uh, I remember when I was a student of theology in Innsbruck, late 60s, early 70s, and I used to go to work in factories in Germany with Gastarbeiter, with Spaniards, Greeks, Turks. There were only Turks, there were no Muslims then. Uh, but then somehow something happened in the 80s, precisely, and the Turks became Muslims, and there were no more Turks, there were all, all Muslims. I assume in France, when you arrive, there were Maghrebis, Marocans, Algerians, but then all of them became Muslim. So it is this situation in which immigrants from Muslim countries or even people who have been there for a second, third generation are simply become the symbolic representation of Islam in European societies, whether they are even pious or practicing Muslims or not. So it is this very interesting phenomenon, the fact that immigrants then come to represent publicly Islam. And obviously this has been very much part of the work you've done. Can, can you tell us something about this public representation first, precisely the veil, the female veil, and all what that it says about sexuality and gender and Islam and Western modernity. And let's see how different it was the image of Islam in the 19th century through Orientalism and the harem and completely the opposite. They were the lightly clothed, we were all uh, 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 very, very modest, and now it's the opposite. So basically, I want you to use this introduction to see how precisely immigrants are caught in a no man's land, 
uh, in the sense that they cannot completely fully become European, but they cannot simply return to the country of origin. So they are Muslims now. And as, you, as, as the title of one of your prominent books says, uh, they are between the lure of fundamentalism and the allure of cosmopolitanism. What do you mean by this between land in which Muslim immigrants in Europe find themselves? Well, first, uh, your observation that first uh, wave of migration, we depicted the actors of uh, the migrants as guest workers, and they were mostly without the family, just the male uh, person, young person, as a workforce. And then comes the families, and there are lots of books, uh, especially in French, on uh, Garçon Arabe, the Arab boy. So then the Arab boy is represented as the person who is not integrated, who doesn't know how to speak the language, who is lazy, who is this and that. And the third wave is this Islamization, which took place with the girls covering themselves, but also following education, quite successful besides. This is also uh, a kind of... Um, uh, surprise maybe, but that the fact that they were covering themselves maybe gave uh, a sense of discipline and they expressed more their ambition for higher education than boys. So mostly the statistics show that girls are doing better. But what is really uh, unexpected is this uh, sense of belonging to Islam came maybe in the third wave and it's in a sense uh, it means a distanciation, distancing oneself from the country of origin of the parents. So in that sense, it's post-migration. That's why they are very critical, the new generation uh, of the uh, label, when we address them as uh, uh, originaire uh, de d'immigration. De, de, uh, so we should, when you relate when you try to identify them as migrant origins, they say we're not migrant origins, it's our parents. We are just here, born here. So uh, I think that's this distanciation, distancing oneself from the national uh, country and culture is very important. And Muslim Islamic um, sense of belonging helps them. It doesn't, it doesn't create a, a problem to be both French and Muslim. You see, whether to be French and Algerian maybe is more complicated. But French and Muslim, Muslim becomes more universal and they redefine it and they do claim that they are French. They belong to that city and locally. So they, these girls and boys and this third generation and the young professionals are much more uh, in the culture of Europe. They are transforming it. That is the interesting uh, maybe subject instead of being totally uh, uh, integrated and assimilated, they keep their difference through Islam. And it becomes a sign of distinction. It is both, as you said at the very beginning, the uh, voluntary adoption of symbols of stigma, because what we consider to be backward and uh, subver subservient women, uh, uh, like veiling and everything related with Islam was considered to be uh, hierarchically speaking less desirable in terms of modernity. In order to be part of the modern world, you have to give up your oriental uh, identity, your Islamic belonging, your way of life, and you should transform yourself. So all these habitus uh, has been reappropriated. It's like black is beautiful. It's the same dynamic. It's the black movement who gave this maybe sense to the movement of the uh, subaltern and the colonized or the mission of civilization, saying that we are civilized also. We have had a superiority, uh, moral superiority. So I think one claim of Islamic Islamization is this claim for uh, moral superiority. Uh, so that, uh, in that respect, they, in the European context, of course, without any authoritarian um, uh, obligations, uh, 
uh, no uh, possibility for a Sharia-led state and so on. So they, it was open, Islamic, Islam was open to a kind of uh, social experimentation. And that's what I really try to understand and name so that we can follow the creativity of this social experimentation in a pluralistic uh, setting. Uh, but of course, it's not easy to make these translations to one another, especially in the case of uh, the veiling issue. I, have, I could have never imagined when I started my research in the late 80s, uh, after 30 years, the, 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 the um, misconceptions and the negative passions are still there in both, in, on both sides. So uh, one feels persecuted, the other one is threatened and uh, hatred, this discourse of hate. And so as if we haven't, uh, researchers has done any work. So the, the, although in practice, we see kind of normalization at the schools and the sports activities in the cities and so on, both religious and non-religious girls or boys, they do interact with each other. In my seminar, we do interact with each other. But in the general public discourse, I would say the negative passions took over. So uh, I could have contributed more to the debate 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is some kind of um, simplification, oversimplification. First, what is it? For instance, the question of agency. Let's go back to our more sociological questions. What is agency in the case of adopting a veil or covering? Even the naming is still problematic for us. Do we call it covering, headscarf, uh, hijab? All right, so there's no fixed uh, name labeling it. Uh, but covering is maybe the most neutral, adopting Islamic dress codes. But it, again, that has changed in the last 20 years. In the Iranian revolution, the word kashmizer, I liked it, calling the chador is kashmizer. They meant, uh, this is hiding the uh, class differences, the poor. Uh, and now it's on the contrary, it became part of the fashion. You can see who has the fashionable covering or not. You cannot distinguish, it's not a uniform at all as it has started in the uh, late 80s. Maybe it was kind of more uniform kind of uh, veiling, but today it's not true. So first the form, we should pay attention, and it came into the fashion uh, industry. And in, in France, maybe you have uh, followed it, there was a kind of uh, protest because some uh, very well-known uh, brands uh, design brands that used uh, the covering for sports activities were banned and they were heavily criticized. So it's not only the question of uh, public institutions, public schools, but even the market uh, industry uh, can be seen as something negative. So the question of uh, agency, form is very important. What kind of a form can maybe create a kind of uh, uh, mutual understanding, negotiation. Can the aesthetic form be a, 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 a source of negotiation? I think yes, because when it becomes a sports uh, accessoire of design, it helps to make it into the society. Uh, secondly, the issue of agency, which is much more difficult because the secular feminists, some of them, not all, but at the beginning, uh, prominent ones, they said, this is not about agency, they are all victims or, uh, of the male power around Islamic patriarchy. Or on the other hand, uh, the, the opposite image was assertive militant Islam. So in both cases, either they are passive, just tools of Islamic patriarchy, or they are carrying radical Islam. So the, the real issue of the subjectivity of these women were erased. There was no possible agency. So what is agency of a pious person? Also, we can ask and uh, try to find out. Should we always, is, does it mean that we need to have a secular definition 
in order to speak about choice and agency. So I think uh, veiling became a very important performative agency that required also a kind of, after 30 years now in Europe and different parts, uh, the, the women who carry it also have reflexivity upon their own uh, veiling. Sometimes they say it became so much ostentatious, so important in the public gaze. Now we are erased. We do not exist as a person. You see, so sometimes it's a reason to take off the veil because in order to find again one's human face, uh, because the veiling as a symbol hides too much the person. On the other hand, the uh, public perception of the veil, as I said, is very problematic. Coming to another layer, uh, uh, also, uh, I would like to raise for all our societies, what is religion uh, in terms of modest, modesty and uh, ostentatious? I mean, these two terms are interesting because we're living in the era of more modernity and capitalism where there's no space for modesty, maybe. So uh, when you come to public, you become ostentatious and hyper-visible. But it's the same for the mosque construction. And the debate with uh, Notre Dame de Paris, uh, the debate of uh, reconstruction re, uh, uh, after the fire, uh, I found out very interesting philosophers and religious people came up with the idea, should we keep, keep the flesh as before? Isn't that too ostentatious? Shouldn't we remind modesty again to the modern world? So I think uh, in the case of Islam, it becomes more and more ostentatious because it becomes publicly visible. And especially now with more populist powers, uh, symbols of Islam becomes very assertive when it can. And also it takes off the very core values of religion. Let's, now you've mentioned populist powers. Let's get to the contemporary condition. You've also been interested in the public sphere as aspects of democratization. I remember last time we were together in India with Charles Taylor and Rajiv Bhargava, we were still discussing promising democratic movements, uh, Taksim Square, the Maidan in Ukraine, etc., etc. Obviously, things have changed dramatically. Democracy is, crisis, is in crisis. Certainly, Turkey's democracy is in serious crisis. You have a, a, a hardening of the authoritarian regime of Islam in Erdogan in Turkey, but also right-wing uh, populist movements in Europe and in the United States. And now we have the pandemic. You mentioned uh, Black is Beautiful as a symbol that actually uh, serves as mother, but now we have a uh, link with the pandemic, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So there are many, many issues which are transversally uh, linked in Turkey, in Europe, in the United States. So I want you to give the opportunity to tell us about, particularly from the perspective of Turkey, you spend several years stuck in Paris without being able to travel to Turkey because of the political condition in Turkey. Now you are stuck in Turkey because of the pandemic. Uh, you had time to reflect upon those time of long-term processes, long durée, as you said. So please, where are we in this particular condition? How do you see this pandemic, the crisis of democracy, issues of racial relations or relations between religious communities? Where are we now, right now? Oh, uh, crisis of pandemic, you're right. I feel um, crisis of pandemic um, limited our mobility everywhere. And it's a kind of uh, deprivation uh, from mobility, but in the essential sense, it deprived us from public life. And I go, go back to my uh, obsessive uh, uh, research topic what is how we create a society without public life? I, I think we live the experience, Erlebnis, I think in German, that is uh, each of us experienced a life without a public, without any access to public life. And in the most elementary sense, going out, shopping, 
going to work, taking a public transport, meeting with each other. So uh, first I think uh, sociologically, uh, uh, individualism also came to an end because there was no way of getting, protecting yourself and to against somebody else. Everybody was involved. So it was both collective and personal. So it changed our definition of individual to collective. You know, that individualism, which can maybe protect yourself in different contexts, even in relation to migrants, you try to find a kind of differentiation between you, self, and the other. In the case of pandemic, no. Everybody was interchangeable. Everybody could have uh, carried from a uh, child uh, to an old person, the pandemic. Of course, then maybe it had a different effect. But again, that uh, also created a kind of different mindset. Uh, our categories between individual and collectivity, personal and public, global and national, I think these all came uh, under investigation. Well, there are things that we say more, we often say authoritarian regimes are, but in, during the pandemic, populist discourse didn't take over. On the contrary, during the pandemic, they were not so relevant, maybe because their discourse, they couldn't find indeed uh, a kind of enmity, politics of enmity, uh, as uh, uh, um, our friend, uh, um, not Agamben, my friend uh, was telling about, you know, uh, the uh, uh, colonial after the, the um, uh, what was the word, the uh, necro, necro, necrophilia, you know, the, in, the, in the English it is translated as politics of enmity. So politics of enmity is the time that we really are passing through. And today, it's, it, with the pandemic, it was very hard. Even if you say it's Chinese, it comes from, it is not from the poor. On the contrary, it came from the rich because they were the ones who were uh, traveling. And uh, so it changed the total discourse. And although the national frontiers, the Agamben's definition of a state of exception was becoming a kind of normality for all the countries, because it was not a state of exception only for poor countries, but a state of exception for developed countries. So we were entering into that and surveillance. So pandemic has shown many aspects to us, surveillance as accepted from the citizens as well. Uh, many aspects that we thought it was a moment of exception and in authoritarian countries, in poor countries, pandemics were related with hygienic poor conditions. So globalization meant also this circulation and flattening and reversal of all these politics, I think. So uh, reversal in the sense of poor and rich and the South and North, uh, European and uh, Indian. So we are all uh, living the same, uh, same thing. In terms of religion, I haven't uh, seen in the case of Turkey, for instance, any arguments that were out, um, th that were medical, that, that were not medical and scientific. Uh, on the contrary, there was a committee, scientific committee, that really tried to control uh, the pandemic disease and give information. It was all science, science. It was not about religious. So the kind of, uh, Maybe we're, that also proved that we're in the secular age in the sense that no uh, government, to my knowledge, uh, came out with uh, condemning, with explaining the pandemic as God's uh, uh, punishment. Because even I think with AIDS, uh, if we compare it with AIDS, uh, which is quite targeted in terms of uh, targeting the populations and stigmatizing certain populations. In the case of this pandemic, we didn't have uh, all that. It was impossible. So uh, I think uh, the pandemic has shown, however, in spite of all this isolation, when Black Lives Matter movements uh, came out, nobody had expected it. 
and they all occupied the public space. So that has shown us to much, to, to much, to how much, to what extent we need the public space in order to move towards democratic uh, societies. There's no democratic society without the public space. And that movement moved from United States to other contexts in Europe, Bristol, Paris, and then again, the monument issue became very important. They destroyed monuments, uh, which uh, was commemorating colonial past and so on. So I think it's in, that, in these terms that we should understand the global uh, circulations and uh, not globalism as something that flattens, but also giving us the possibility of new ways of uh, maybe imagining our societies in a more pluralistic way. This is only resistance. So before we move to the question and answer uh, part of our uh, webinar, and I want to remind the audience, you have a question and answer uh, symbol there. You can write your questions and I will then con uh, pass on these questions to Professor Gelle. But I, want, I have a, a final comment and I would like you to, to, to give your take on it. Another controversy about precisely a different type of public space, a different type of monument, Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, two weeks ago on Friday, July the 23rd, for the first time in 80 years, there was a Muslim Friday prayer in Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia that had been turned into a monument in kind, a kind of a architectural uh, 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 tourist space, uh, a kind of, and it is of course a, 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 a monument that had been declared uh, uh, as, a, as a global uh, 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 symbolic monument for, by the United Nations. And the Friday prayer was delivered by Professor Dr. Eli Erbas, the director of the Directorate of Religious Affairs. How do we interpret precisely this move on the part of the regime of Erdogan to precisely now to revert Hagia Sophia from this uh, sacred space that could be accessed by everybody to again revert it to a, a practicing space, a mask for prayer? Exactly. It illustrates where, very well how the monuments and public space becomes a battleground and also a possibility or a claim to rewrite history. Because Hagia Sophia, and as you say, Hagia Sophia and not Saint Sophie, which is the Greek origin, which is also used in Turkish for the Turkish uh, version. We call it Hagia Sophia, not Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia. And I think uh, uh, there has been already these claims to uh, convert it to a uh, Muslim uh, mosque. And again, I like your word revert. This is the Spanish version because Spanish Muslims, when they, uh, when they Christians, when they convert themselves to uh, Islam, they call it, they revert. So it is exactly, uh, Muslims say this has been before the museum, that is the uh, Atatürk's uh, uh, Kemalist uh, definition uh, in 1934 decision to uh, turn the Hagia Sophia into a museum. It was, it is more than like a secular therefore space uh, and now they reverted to the uh, times when it was the imperial mosque because after the, after the, the, the uh, uh, conquest of uh, uh, Constantino uh, the uh, Hagia Sophia became a very important uh, imperial mosque. So it was, uh, there was also texts and myths around it. They tried, they kept it, they restored it uh, in during different times of uh, um, catastrophes and so on. So I think what is uh, today interesting is going back to that uh, moment, not as a nostalgia, I wouldn't read it as a nostalgia, but again, as a kind of assertive uh, Islam uh, in today's world. And not uh, to my uh, opinion, unfortunately, it makes part of this national Islam and not recognizing the, uh, uh, the past, the pluralistic past, the Byzantine past. Well, I must say the 
Atatürk, the, the Kemalist Turkey had not recognized enough, but we were just starting to open up chairs, history on Byzantine past heritage and so on. But uh, what strikes me more, because this claim against the West, West, there was also this claim against the Western hegemony and showing uh, Turkey as being capable of deciding as a national sovereignty and uh, becoming more therefore uh, assertive of their Islamic identity and it's not only a nation state issue because it has also a message uh, in the global publics. It's not like the creation of a mosque in Taksim Square which has been a very important debate between religious and secular and the seculars felt a lot of resentment of the construction of Taksim, but this one is really related more. It's even, uh, it hurt more the feelings of the secular because it was more related with also Atatürk Kemalism. And also it is, I think, a broader uh, impact on the global stage. Uh, what I find uh, interesting in terms of their attack on the West, they haven't thought about the Eastern uh, Christianity. This is about Eastern Christianity. This is the Orthodox heritage and as if it is just the refusal uh, of the Western uh, Christianity. I, I, I am, I am uh, disappointed that Turkey has not, during all these years, uh, discovered the importance of Orthodox uh, heritage in Turkey, especially when they were also with Greece, Russia, Balkanic heritage. And the Eastern Christianity is not the same as the Western Christianity. And Turkey is the country who really has to come to terms with that. And the political Islam puts them into one box, right? So I think this is one thing that uh, I found quite disturbing. It's more like ideological discourse. So instead of opening up in a pluralistic way, uh, a kind of uh, maybe particular day for uh, praying for also uh, Orthodox uh, Christianity would have been much more interesting. This also reminded me one more thing of the Cordu Mesquita Cathedral in Cordu, because that's why I wrote the Eastern Christianity. So what we are facing is on the one hand, we have Eastern Christianity. On the other hand, we have Islam becoming more and more Western. And the Western Islam also had this long-term layers of uh, history in Andalus. And uh, so that also heritage my is today. Hmm? That's in why I'm country. coming to that, in your country. This is the place, so we have this Byzantine, Ottoman, and then we have the Arab, Hispanic. And this Andalus has been the most important reference for the, uh, the, the, the uh, cohabitation of three monotheism uh, in a pluralistic way. And the Cordoba Mesquita, which means mosque, Mesquita Cathedral, is also has been under controversy for many years. I have been there during my research on, on European Islam. And that controversy also seemed very interesting because there was one reverted uh, Spanish person who's that now who asked for the right for Muslims to pray in Mesquita and he was refused. At that time, uh, Turkey was in uh, alliance of civilizations, have yes. signed Zapatero. So things have changed. They were not, they, the things that have not followed a linear line. Unfortunately, it, it, it took a Swerve. It took a different direction. So, uh, and then uh, in the case of this mesquita, uh, I think the bishop has decided, uh, has proposed to take off the name of mesquita uh, from the uh, mesquita Cordoba, mesquita cathedral, so that nobody would come with the cultural memory of the mosque in uh, Spain. So I think we are uh, really through these monuments, we're trying to erase so centuries of historical layers, whether we go in the sense of more pluralistic or whether we go in the sense of uh, more nationalistic, mono monotheistic and monistic culture, 
Unfortunately, these are signs that take us towards the erasure and simplification of the past. Um, we could continue on this topic and obviously, indeed, uh, on Eastern Orthodoxy and the fact that uh, Istanbul is, of course, the home of the Patriarch Bartholomew of uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and what does it mean in terms of the soft power of geopolitics of Turkey. But let's move on now to the uh, question and answer. Let me begin with a question by uh, William Lees Levinson. And he asked, do you see parallels with a variety of movements and their resurgence? Everything from right-wing extremism, white supremacy in the US and in many European countries, to, for instance, formerly less traditional Jews non-traditional Jews attraction to ultra-orthodoxy or a resurgence of fundamental Christianity. In other words, is all of this part of resurgence of global fundamentalism against modernity, you say? Well, I think uh, modernity is in trouble as well. <laughs> it's not only religions, but uh, uh, I, I, I thought in the case of uh, Europe, um, Muslim question should have thought in relation to Jewish question. And it is Jewish question is the cursor between Europe and Islam. Instead of thinking only in the, through the lenses of one population, because a Jewish uh, population in Europe has the past, the, the memory of the past. And we ask, and rightly so, to the uh, Muslims living in Europe to understand uh, and to associate themselves with the history of Holocaust, okay, which is very true. And, but I think we also should ask now Jews to enter into some of the controversies with Muslims, like I said in the case of halal kosher, in the case of gender issues, or in the case of circumcision of boys. I mean, that's, I, it's not a direct uh, answer to your question, but my take is therefore how to create, how to change, how to create displacements of these uh, uh, controversies through a kind of linkages between different uh, social groups, religions, and communities. That's somehow it is taking place, but not enough. It's all, all very maybe uh, minor issues, but I think. I believe, still believe that Europe is a site where we can experience pluralism and learn from each other and counter uh, the, uh, uh, what do you say, it? I mean, radical religious movements. What scares me more is this authoritarian nationalist uh, moves that really hinders all possibility for social experimentation, dialogical relation, so we don't know how to uh, progress anymore because it is over uh, control. Uh, if you are not in tune uh, in conformity with the national religious um, definitions of citizenship, then you are in trouble. This is the same in, in uh, Russia, in uh, India, in many other places. That's, that's, I think, we should fight against. A second question comes from Humeira Selchuk Viricic, who is a student of mine from Georgetown, just graduated from Georgetown, is back in Turkey, and she asked uh, to Professor Gele about the role of the Dianet, the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Modern Turkey. Can Dianet's public presence as a government agency ever be reconciled with its original Kemalist aim, namely to privatize religion. Would then Turkey be better off if it had no Dianet to run Musk and most recently Hagia Sophia in the name of the government? I didn't understand the last sentence. If uh, we wouldn't, were going... wouldn't Turkey be better off if it had no Dianet to run Musk and most recently Hagia Sophia in the name of the government? Yeah, 
I don't know, but it is a very, uh, right, it's a very good question because the ANEP became a very important institution, although it was criticized by the Islamic uh, movements of the 70s and 80s, because the ANEP, it was considered to be imams with a tie, that is Kemalist, imams who were, uh, who were, um, uh, accepting more secular values of uh, Atatürk and today they have uh, this government they have made Dianet uh, the institution for uh, most important institution it depends how it can be used I agree with you but I had a, a, a student Zehra Cunilera who made a very interesting research on theologians in, uh, in European from European background who followed the uh, theological um, teaching uh, of the Anet for uh, people uh, born in European countries. And I think that kind of initiative, I don't know what happens it now, but that kind of initiative was very good because it is, again, I'm taking the more European perspective because the uh, formation of imams were one of the most important subjects in European countries. And, they were saying we, they shouldn't be sent from countries of origin who doesn't speak the same language, who doesn't share the cultural issues of the youth uh, who are raised in Europe. And so uh, they were looking for ways of uh, formation of imams. And Dianet has came uh, with this uh, program for teaching the uh, Turkish or youth, but uh, living in Europe, born in European cities, and so therefore providing a kind of formation back and forth. So I don't know if these um, incentives, these programs were uh, in the initial stage where we had more hope that secular religious divide could have uh, been um, surpassed by pluralistic and democratic ways. The moment maybe Turkey was moving towards Europe and Europe also uh, maybe was not as hostile to Turkey as uh, we could have imagined. But for the moment, I don't know, for instance, I would have liked to see what Dianet would still do for the theological education of the European youth, European born youth. Then we have a question from Nassim Gul, which I think is based on a misunderstanding, so I want you to clarify it. Uh, this question so that there is no misunderstanding. Nassim Gul writes, from one side you are praising multiculturalism and at the same time you are against the veil which is either part of a religious symbol or a culture. I never read it or heard you to be against the veil. So he adds, I feel in the name of multiculturalism you are supporting majoritarianism. Can you respond to this, I think, misunderstanding? Well, I think it's a very bizarre reading because I am basically criticized because I have opened up ways of understanding veiling that uh, I'm not against the veil. I'm not a spokesperson of the veil either. I'm just, uh, I have done a lot of research and writing, so I think I just asked the person to go back to the texts and read it. Good, thanks. Um, then there is a question from Spencer Cook. It's a more uh, particular question on a European particular context of Germany. How do you view European popular media rather than news media the tackle head on questions of multiculturalism, such as Turkey's fear Anfänger and the films of Fatih Akin in the German case. I didn't understand the last phrase. Fatih uh, Akin's film, let me speak about, I, I, I find Fatih Akin's film most interesting films because he is, um, uh, he's doing what I'm trying to do in sociology and much better. He's adopting a double gaze between uh, his origin, migrant origin, but he's also uh, a German citizen. And he has 
given us images of Europe for the first, first time, maybe uh, in terms of the, uh, from the life world of the migrants. And I, I find his, uh, his work always crossing the borders between countries and so on, and telling a story uh, of uh, Turkish, but also Greeks living in Germany in the most interesting way. So Germany, in a way, uh, in my, maybe in my point of view, was much more open uh, to receive the Turkish expressions, Turk literature and film on uh, the, the way they, the Turkish writers, like this German literature turn, the book uh, that has uh, spoke about the Turkish uh, people inventing a new language, cannot you think? And then the Turkish filmmakers living in Germany, this German Turk, this hyphenated identities, in a way, really uh, was more accepted in German public than uh, in France with Algerians, for instance. Maybe because the history was so much more problematic and hurtful uh, that in the case of France with Algerians. In the case of Turkey and Germany, I think uh, these cases show that uh, there is still a space for, uh, in, in the cultural realm, to come up with the complexities of uh, the migrant, uh, Turkish German, let's say, uh, ways of living in uh, Germany. Then we have a question from Andrew Condon from the United Kingdom, and this may be the last question. Uh, he writes, in the UK, the NGO MAMA has said that since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, right-wing groups have been routinely blaming and saying theories targeting Muslims as somehow responsible for the spread of the coronavirus. This targeting has also been occurring in India and also in the United States to a degree. How can secular and religious leaders challenge these attacks without emboldening those who seek to create these false correlations. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the question and the comment, because uh, I, I, uh, you're right. In India, uh, especially in Delhi, because of a kind of event, they targeted the Muslims in India. Uh, and I didn't know that some of the NGOs in uh, Britain also has done this. Uh, but still, I don't think uh, we should be careful about all that, but I don't think it became a really issue all over the world, if it uh, uh, became a real issue. But you're right, I mean, everyone searches for a scapegoat in these circumstances, and uh, we should know how to counter uh, these, um, these um, false fake news, in a way. Um. Let me ask, I think we have time for just the final question. This comes from Gobhar from Aligarh Muslim University in India, since we are talking from India. Uh, do you consider European modernity really secular? Elizabeth Sackman Hart in her works against, against argues, in her work argues that the American foreign policy was never dissociated from religion. Uh, I do agree. I, I don't think secularism is something uh, totally void of religion and national values. Uh, there are, um, I think it's Etienne Balibar, the French thinker, even himself, he criticized French laïcité as catho laïcité, that is first Catholic and then laïc. And in the Turkish case, the secularists were also first Sunni, Sunni uh, Muslims and then uh, secular. So secularism is uh, maybe a reference point, but never totally neutral to the particular religion in which they grow up or uh, the national values. You are totally right. And European secularism neither is totally out of, uh, I think that's what we have tried to do 
uh, with our colleagues, with Jose and others, uh, trying to show that secularism also has a history and it is embedded in different uh, parts of the world, in different forms, habitations, as Dipesh Chakravarti would speak about European modernity. So I think what is interesting about secularism is not uh, is maybe to see how it moved from one culture to another and take different forms. But uh, what is interesting for us, can we still serve it as a tool for more inclusionary politics? A, a space, if it's totally neutral, it's never totally neutral, like in the case of a museum, <laughs> okay? It says, uh, so can we create the conditions for a more inclusive, pluralistic social life? Is it the only way, is it secularism? I don't know, but for the moment, uh, I think secularism, at least in its uh, claims, want to keep an equal distance to all religions and believers and non-believers. In that respect, I think it's still a very important hermeneutic tool for opening up a pluralistic space. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Neely Fair, for the very, very interesting conversation. I've enjoyed it very much. And I'm looking forward to the time when we can again have a personal conversation in presence. Last time was in Paris. Let's see when, when it's the last time. Actually, our friend Rajiv Bhargava just sent also talking about India. Uh, greetings to you. Uh, thank you all for participating in this webinar. Again, those of you who are registered, uh, very soon you will receive a link because this webinar has been video to the video of the uh, conversation. And those of you who may not receive the link, it will, it will be probably available sometime at the beginning of next week for everybody. So Nilifer, again, thank you, thank you very much. And to everybody, thank you, thank you so much. Until the next time, the, our next webinar will be on August 27th, again with another colleague and friend, Craig Calhoun you will receive invitations and a more clear idea of what the topics of this conversation will be. So thank you again and goodbye to everybody.